<clears throat> so getting into tonight's lecture, we're going to talk about profiles and clustering. We're mostly going to do hierarchical clustering. A lot of you are probably familiar with k-means. That's also a, a tool you can use, but we're going to leave kind of, don't have enough time to cover both, basically. So we're going to talk mostly about hierarchical clustering, um, knowing that there are other clustering options out there. So today mostly it's going to be on memory and semanticity, how we did categories last week, or kind of using memory, and then this segues really nicely into latent semantic analysis, which we'll do next week, which is like that and topics are my two favorite lectures um, because they are kind of the culmination of, of models that are both visual and um, applied like you can create these sort of like we made all these cool network models that were really more visual LSA's kind of got that flavor where I can make pictures of the model but really it's used well to to explore what's going on in the text and to apply to maybe new texts so for example the LS, uh, LSA has been used broadly um, in all kinds of contexts, but one of its most famous contexts is that it was able to correctly answer questions on the TOEFL, so the English fluency exam, um, and so we'll cover those next week. Um, but this topic for the linguistics part is really, really nice to kind of like get you ready for that. Uh, and really into networks. So not network analysis, like what we did with Harry Potter, but more about like the idea of what is a semantic network, which we could visualize with a network analysis. Okay. Um, and then my big research area, which is semantic feature models. And so literally like closed the paper I was writing about feature models to come um, teach this class. And to me, this is sort of a really interesting halfway point that has some like in, like research, more traditional cognitive research that can be really applied well to business contexts. Um, so that's why I'm here. So a little bit on memory. Um, memory, kind of broadly, uh, is to have the basic definitions that people get in like an intro to psych course. Um, and so memory is obviously very complex, but these kind of generalized terms help us understand maybe kind of what people are going to remember. Um, and so if you want to apply this, let's say you're working for your uh, business, kind of looking at um, how people perceive a company or a brand, because this can be really, really important, right? Um, what you might, you might help to understand these kind of networks and memory. Okay. So episodic memory, which is really tied to our categories that are um, uh, exemplars, are the memory for events. So sometimes episodes, like a TV series, right, or our mental, dic our mental diary, sometimes is what it's called. Okay. And our semantic memory, which is our more fact-based knowledge, or our mental dictionary. And the separation between these two is kind of fuzzy, that you can't have episodic memory without semantic memory. Right. Wait, yes, right. Um, meaning I can't remember a football game if I don't know what football is. And there's some really famous cases of people who've had one or the other broken. Um, and so if you've seen the movie Memento or 51st Dates, this is an example of anterograde amnesia where you can't form new memories, but you, you're really, you can't, your episodic memory is kind of broken at a certain point. Okay. Um, and these are based on several famous uh, people that actually did have these problems okay. uh, due to different diseases and epilepsy was one of them. Okay. And so we can put these two together into a lexicon. So a lot of times people think of lexicon as just a dictionary, but we see that this is where we integrate dictionary and episodes, right? Like, oh, I remember that this article that I was looking up is got a weird citation because, you know, I remember reading it in school. So understanding the event of like what is a citation in a paper and reading this particular paper kind of merged together. <clears throat> so kind of classic semantic, excuse me, classic semantic theory is that we have this connotation denotation distinction when we think about words. 
So we're reading along, and really a lot of this next section is about uh, meaning making, building mental pictures or mental models of, of what text is saying, um, understanding coherency and context. <clears throat> so if you're trying to, um, let's say, build a picture of brand, or uh, if you think about TV shows, trying to build a little world, this uh, understanding of memory is important. So a denotation is its like core, essential meaning. What does this word mean? Right? So dog is has a has a core meaning of an animal. Right? Its connotation though is all of its secondary meanings. Right? So this could be um, if you think about like American Idol, does it Brandy Jackson was famous for always being like yo dog constantly, right? That's no longer puppies. Right? It's a different context. Um, and how we represent those in our, in our mental dictionary is a really interesting question. So how do you understand what people know what words mean, but also all of their connotations? Okay. So it's kind of like, how do people understand the difference between Merriam-Webster's website and like Urban Dictionary's website? Okay. Okay. And this gets us into the problem of polysemy, okay, which is where words have multiple meanings. And models of this, so it is as true in natural language processing kinds of, kinds of contexts, like uh, the 520 class, uh, and semantic network models, kind of where we're going today, is that multiple meanings are often difficult to capture uh, because one meaning always is more frequent than another. And so the frequency of use and meaning um, connotation is important to include in these kinds of models. Okay. Uh, and so I have again mentioned that if you don't know the answer, it's frequency. So the frequency of each of these meanings, their interpretations, is what drives how they how these models get built. Okay. So some really classic theories of, of semantics, now not categories, although they do overlap, these two things kind of kind of cross. Um, is the first theory is really a simple one. Words mean what they refer to. Sometimes this is called the bow wow theory because uh, it's this idea that we came up with words that sort of had this onomatopoeic or like things sound the way they look. Right? So bark sounds like bark. Okay. That only works for like a small amount of words though. And referential theory kind of crashes and burns when we think about um, abstract concepts. Okay. And so then they tried to add this intention idea, not intent, but intention, um, where it, we're trying to understand the relationship between several concepts. So like, what's this sort of abstract meaning building or world building between concepts? Um, and then the extension of the word, where the word, what it stands for in the world, so it's kind of relationship between things uh, and its relationship to the outside world, instead of just straight, you know, a dog is this picture, which would be referential theory. A lot of this just it like it sounded okay, but it didn't totally work. Okay. Um, and so maybe there's like these like. Uh, complex meanings that we can create. So we talked about these last week, the theory theories for category learning, uh, which was this idea that we have these theories about the way that world should be, and they either match our category or they don't. Same idea, model theoretic semantics, are sometimes called truth theoretic semantics, are our models of complex reasoning. And these work well until you realize that humans are not logical in the least at all, especially in our decision making, based on semantics, so we kind of had to go somewhere else with some of this. Okay. And network theory has stuck around the longest. Um, there are also neural net models. I'm not going to cover a whole lot of those. Um, but this idea that concepts are linked to each other just simply because of their frequency. So sometimes it's called association, um, but words have sort of two paths. They have a, a co-occurrence or a direct relationship 
where they occur in similar contexts. So this is really important for the next couple of weeks. So words that are similar have the same friends. They occur in the same places in texts. And then they have the sort of indirect associations or more meaning-based associations where um, they're, they occur in the same context, but so do all of their other friends. So this is kind of like a secondary network, sometimes called a two-hop network. So I occur next to, um, like, uh, let's see, you and I, right? Um, but I is also related to you through the word me, right? He, she, these are all pronouns. Um, so we kind of have these direct and indirect relationships between words. Uh, and the two biggest theories that, that started this and really, <clears throat> in my opinion, revolutionized thinking about semantic memory as this giant network system are Collins and Quillian and Collins and Loftus. This is actually the Loftus who does the bump crash. She's really famous for her eyewitness testimony, memory, misinformation effect. Um, but her early work was in semantic networks. This is one of the original pictures, and it's a poorly copied PDF, so sorry about that. But uh, the idea was, this is WordNet. So um, uh, if you take my other class, you know I love WordNet. And so the idea is that the words um, have this structure, and this is what we talked about last week. These categories have structures. So this is the superordinate, or the more abstract category. The um, basic level naming and then down into the subordinate, uh, more concrete names. Each one has a set of features. So this model kind of encompasses all those like feature list theories, where each one is a, is a and has a relationships. Um, so bird is an animal. Animals have skin, can move around. So these are has us. Moving up and down is is a. A canary is a bird. Bird is an animal. Um, so this was kind of like the culmination of featureless theory and um, if you put the pictures of the individual items on top of that, it would also be exemplar theory. Okay. So it's trying to combine those two things together. And it's built into this hierarchy of, of structures and these here would also be hierarchical, meaning prototypicality, their frequency in, in feature strength. Okay. Highly influential. Um, model, and it actually was developed as an early form of, of translation, language translation, and trying to map these models, to, like models of different languages together. Um, and so they picked natural categories to build this on, and that's really handy, but the problem with some of this naturalistic stuff is that it just doesn't apply to more than half of language. <laughs> So these models often work well on very like concrete objects <laughs> that you can feel and touch, like trees. Um, and so they kind of built it in this biology kind of kingdom phylum class arrangement where there's a hierarchy between nodes where some nodes are, are superordinate and subordinate. And the links between words were either is a, so bird is an animal, or has a, for a feature type. Okay. And there ended up being more than just this, but this is where they started. And uh, they took that sentence verification task, like dog is an animal, dog has skin, and used the model to predict what the response latencies would be if you were human, um, and showed that this hierarchical structure should work because it, the, the data from real people matched the data from the model, okay. but, big bucks, not really an, a representation of all of memory. So a better model would represent like what memory is fully doing, not just these naturalistic, very easy to categorize objects. Okay. Um, it doesn't handle conjoint frequency. So let me back up here. Um, first of all, animals have skin is almost never really mentioned. Um, like real participants don't say that. Um, eats and breathes is a pretty good one. 
uh, but it doesn't mention the conjoined frequency. So when something has wings, it usually flies. Okay. It's a very highly correlated feature. Okay. And when something has feathers, it usually is on the wings. So it doesn't capture the fact that these three are highly correlated objects um, and that they're really one set of features instead of each individualized features. So it doesn't capture this kind of relationship between features as well. <laughs> and then it's really bad at the uh, relatedness effect. So um, we talked about this as procedural invariance with humans. If you ask them the same question two different ways, you sometimes get two different answers. A model has a similar problem where when statements are untrue, people are very fast at being like, a dog is a tree. Nope. But the model doesn't handle that very well. Okay. So if you say a pine is a church, it's actually slower than a pine is a flower. Okay. Now this is actually an interest, super interesting point that led to the next set of models because this, if you think about this for a second, it makes sense. Because if you say a pine is a church, what's really happening is the indirect association of bench because most church benches are made of wood. Um, and they might be pine. Uh, so what's really happening is bench and wood are indirectly influencing in this model, um, but humans, that, that's a pretty quick rejection. So why, why does that work? Although indirectly it, it makes sense for that to be kind of a little bit slower than a pine is a flower. Um, and that problem uh, in the model led to some interesting questions about the relationship of indirect relations. So what can we do to build a better model? And then how do we handle the prototypicality effect? So there is a hierarchy there, but it's not quite the hierarchy that they're presenting. Okay. So how do we deal with the fact that some features are more typical than others because they're more salient and they're more frequent? Well, what you do is instead you build uh, the spreading activation model. And I really can't understate like how important this has been for cognitive science. Um, let's see. As a note, I know citation counts are not the most representative thing of, of how important research is, but this has been cited 10,000 times. That's a lot. Right now it is quite old. It's from the 70s, um, but super influential um, to many other future models, okay? especially uh, in natural language processing. So a lot of computational linguistics uh, mimics this structure. Okay? And the network models that we built in class did as well. So um, I'm not going to cover all the models that have come after this. Uh, we're going to cover a couple, but mainly if you understand this, you can kind of understand where a lot of these ideas of building these network models has came from. Um, and instead, the, the note is that everything is connected to everything at different strengths. Meaning that if I have fire engine here in the middle, now, in this picture, they tried to draw it somewhat where the closer it is, the more related it is, but it's not necessarily the best. You know, they had to cram it into a fancy journal, so they had to make it small. But uh, fire engines are red, so it's related directly to red, which is then indirectly, fire engine is indirectly related to the other colors. Okay. Um, very clearly directly related to fire, to house. Um, I would also argue water on here, but... From red, you can then end up at roses, because roses are red, okay, or sunsets. And so we have these little individual networks of words that are connected to each other um, because of their direct associations. But then you have the indirect of association where fire engines actually kind of related to roses through red. Okay. And each one of these uh, lines has a different weight. So how do you deal with frequency, correlated features, prototypicality, all these kind of little issues is you just weight each um, line strength differently. So when we made these network model pictures, we colored them by weight. Um, when you build one of these models, they're structured by weight. Okay. Um, 
And what is spreading activation? Well, not only was this model influential in the idea that it influenced the way that people thought about memory and built models, it also influenced our understanding of explaining psychological phenomena. So for example, um, priming, which we'll do more of in a couple weeks, is this idea that when they hear one word, and if it's related to the next word, that second word is faster. It's, I say doctor, then I say nurse, faster nurse because you've already been thinking about doctor. Uh, if I said doctor and then tree, tree is not really sped up by knowing about doctors. Okay. And so it's called spreading activations because what happens if I say fire engine, that gets me thinking about red, which then gets me thinking about roses. And so it's, I've always thought about how it's water spreading down a hill um, because this thing makes me think of the next thing, which makes me think of the next thing. Okay. So if you've ever had one of those days where you're trying to explain to someone, what are you thinking about? Oh, I'm thinking about this. And they're like, why? And you're like, well, I started here and then this came up in my brain and then this and then this what you're describing is a spreading activation um, kind of model it also very nicely um, maps onto what we think the brain some of the neural pathways in the brain do so it's a big deal all right so they restructured this it became more complex we talked a little bit about strength here it's not hierarchical but the hierarchy is still there, built into the, the, the links between the nodes. Their, their strengths are now representing the hierarchy. Um, and that led to a whole slew of models. These were being developed at the same time, but a whole slew of models on uh, connectionism. That's the new fancy phrase for neural net. Like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Connectionism is the old phrase for neural net models that we see. A very popular right now. Um, sometimes. Anytime you hear deep learning, depending on what they're doing, they're doing kind of neural net models. Um, and that really started uh, with McClellan and Rummelhart doing a lot of work on this idea of like we can represent almost anything uh, as these input nodes and these output nodes. And then there's always this sort of hidden section of the brain that's doing something and we don't know what it is. Okay. So connectionist modeling has been used in everything. TBH. Um, and the idea is that everything's kind of linked to everything, and the indirect links sometimes allow us to understand what's actually going on. So priming, where one thing speeds up our reaction to another thing, um, is based on spreading activation. Okay. And um, when we look at the features or the attributes, of different meaning pieces. Um, what they think happens is, let's say I'm reading about a dog, okay, and that requires me to then activate all the things that are related to dog. Well, those features are related because they're um, an important component of dog. It's not built into the node, now it's connected closely to fur and ears and barks and tails. And so I then go from dog to all of its features, its network of related features, and its network of friends, like cat. Okay. And the idea of this kind of semantic decomposition works really well if it's a simple visual thing. Um, and maybe we can create these semantic primitives, or we can represent words with as few features as possible. And this kind of gets us back to categories last week. Okay. This idea is really heavily based on Katz and Fodor, who are working at the same time as Collins and Loftus. And so the network model sort of argues that we go from dog to all of its features, to all of its friends, to all of their friends and features. Katz and Fodor were essentially like, well, our understanding of meaning is not all of these activations of all these different friends and features, but instead is like, here's each little word, here's what each little word means, and we're going to build up meaning, um, or our understanding of what we're reading, for example, by just adding all of the different meanings together. So like, essentially their idea was if you took the dictionary definition for every word in a sentence and pasted it together, you would understand what meaning of a, of a like say a newspaper article was. Okay. Um, so first, people broke down words into their features, 
And the second, um, we would combine features based on restraints. And those restraints are things that are tied to meaning, like you should, you know, kick a ball and not kick the moon, that kind of thing. Um, and the interesting thing about this, this theory is not so popular anymore, but the interesting idea is that people kind of do this and they kind of do network models. And so we're trying to find the happy medium between the two. So can we build this decomposition into a network model? Um, or do we have to kind of say, well, there's this other process that's occurring on the model at the same time? Oh, and it's the constraints really that are the interesting point because in a, in a, in a network model, and spreading activation argues that everything gets activated. So all these different pieces are just coming on, they're lighting up, so to speak. But clearly, at some point, we turn some of them off because their interpretation makes no sense given everything else we're reading. So that's the thing we're trying to capture. It's when things, especially at polysemy, when there's multiple meanings, when things are appropriate and when they're not. And so, uh, what we're going to do today is create uh, clusters um, and what we're trying to do with this cluster analysis is really create um, oops, this kind of cluster set sorry I'm gonna I went to the wrong slide right so create these like clusters. We know that everything's related to everything, but can we figure out what these little clusters should be given the data that we have? Okay. Sometimes this is called a behavioral profile. Um, I would say that most people just call this cluster analysis, but the book talks about it as behavioral profile, so I'm going to call it both. Um, and you can use this as a classification scheme. So sometimes clustering is used to classify. Um, and it's really handy when there's just a very large set, especially of categorical data, and you don't expect there to be interactions, right? So everything we did last week kind of assumed that there would be these complex interactions between the data points, um, so you built it into trees, right? Um, and so we're going to kind of transform our data into proportions and cluster it together. And so a lot of these examples that especially the ones you've already seen, is when we're taking some sort of sentence and coding it for lexical information and then applying this analysis to it. And so the, I like this analysis because it kind of shows you um, what combinations of things tend to go together. It's also very handy for uh, polysemy problems. <clears throat> So we're going to look a little bit more at this causative, causal data that we've been using, but now a much bigger set. Um, and so I really want to highlight here that there's no one correct analysis choice. It kind of depends on the flavor of what you want. And what I mean by that is like this causative data we used last week, we've used it like three or four times actually. So we could use it in logistic regression to predict one of two outcomes. We could use it in a conditional inference tree if we expect a lot of interactions. Or here, we have just a crap ton of variables. Okay. Um, don't really expect some interactions, just kind of want to see what clusters together. Uh, so this is often driven by the expectation of, of in your hypothesis, what are you expecting to find and which um, what type of data you have a little bit too. Obviously logistic regression is for categorical outcomes where regular regression is for continuous outcomes. Okay. All right, so we're going to work this on many more causal, uh, causative constructions. Um, so not just have and get, but now be made to and a couple of others. We've got the animacy of the actor, the animacy of the actee, uh, the type of event, is it negative, is there a co-reference, am I talking about myself, and is it possessive? Okay. And uh, this particular uh, brain fart, this particular 
analysis type is really based on the idea that you have completely categorical data. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute here, we're going to switch to where you can use any type of data. Okay. But if you have completely categorical data, what you can first do is create uh, vectors of proportions from that data. You can calculate the distance between these vectors and then cluster it. Um, once we get to distancing, you can do a lot more with distancing. But so I, th I think the name behavioral profile, unless you're a clinical psychologist, <laughs> is a totally different phrase. But uh, uh, behavioral profile of a word it usually means that the data started as completely categorical, and then dance, interpretive dance. For validation, what we're going to do is talk about um, how do I know that the model works well and how might I apply it in the future. So we're going to create profiles of verbs. And you see we have more now other than have and get have. And get, I'm sorry, have, get, and make is what we were using before. But now we've actually broken it down into a couple of different options. So be made to, cause to, get to, but we also have get past tense, get a, a third present participle, like get going, um, have, have past tense, have participle, and then just make. So we're actually separating them out by a little bit by their auxiliary um, nature of the, the second verb um, as well. So are there differences between get to and, you know, uh, get I can only think of like get clued in, which is not the best example, but get going, right? So there are different instances where these travel together or they all just get. Like, uh, so this question really here is about polysemy. Right? Are these all the same or do they have different networks and different friends? All right, so what we're going to do uh, to create a data set that we can work with is take this completely categorical data set and use the split function. This will just kind of create little mini subsets. So it's a list of data frames that are each of those causative constructions. We're then going to um, delete the first column that has what the variable is in it. So if that variable we split on, we're just going to take it out. We're going to use this BP, or behavioral profile function, and apply it to each of the data frames in the list. Okay. And then we're going to shove that all back together into a data set using do call, where it just R binds all of our lists back together. Okay. So I think this is a bit easier to understand if you look at it here. Okay. So let me show you. So let's see, our data set that we have is cause. Okay. So here's what cause looks like, completely categorical. Often difficult to work with completely categorical data. Let us split it. Okay. Now I have a, uh, a list of all those data frames. Okay. I have removed that first column. So when I ran this the first time, Each one of them had this variable CX variable, but I didn't really want to keep that because that's the factor I split on. So I'm going to use L apply to just clear it out. Okay. Um, I have never been good at L apply, but <laughs> this I understand. Remove the first variable. I'm going to create using BP. Now BP is a function Rling that creates a, a behavioral profile, which is effectively um, a bunch of different mini tables. So let's look at that. I cannot spell today. I can't spell any day. I don't know why I would say today. Here we go. So. Now I have essentially turned that entire data frame um, for BP here into a bunch of tables. 
So the animacy of the actor is 96% animate when it's being made to. So this is just a bunch of like um, running the table command over and over and over again. Uh, and here you can see these are perfect predictors. Where the co-reference is no on this one and uh, possessive is no when it's being made to. Okay. And you'll see that these variables are not very useful because they have these really terrible splits. Right, where they're um, not distinct. So once we do that, we can now look at what the, this data set looks like. So it just merges them all back together. Okay. So it's essentially a bunch of tables. A proportion table for all of our variables. This is where we start adding distancing. So the logic behind distancing is to measure in a multi-dimensional space how similar two things are. And this is like super crucial for pretty much everything from here to the end of the semester because um, once we start thinking about language as a network on this kind of Collins and Loftus idea now we can really start imagining, well, how do I put a number on that strength? Is it how correlated they are? Is it how frequent they are? Is it how far apart they are in the model? And so we could put frequency, but then use a distance metric to see how far apart two words are that aren't directly related. So there's lots of cool things we can do. And distancing is going to be super important next week, too. So a little bit on distancing. Um, the more similar two vectors are, two rows or two columns, essentially, right? correlation is kind of a metric for distancing. Um, but the more similar they are, the closer the distance. Okay? So the closer to zero it is, the closer together they are. Right? Correlation is kind of built the other way. So it's how similar they are is, is pretty much saying how much close to one. But here, things that have a zero distance mean they're the same thing. So think about distancing as like Google Maps. There are three popular types. Euclidean, I would say I see Euclidean the most. It's the hypotenuse. It's the direct relationship here between P to Q. So the shortest distance, or sometimes people call this as the crow flies. Um, Manhattan distance is sort of like if you were walking around in Manhattan is the idea. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually where it came from, but I think so. Uh, it's one city block to the next. So you can't walk through the building. You have to go down to 6th Ave and then up Broadway. Okay. Um, so it's down the blocks. Okay. Uh, maximum distance is the longest side. And so it's, a, it's meant to be a representation of the, the furthest they get away from each other, either um, uh, straight down or straight across. Okay, so it's the longest one. Most popular types are Euclidean and Manhattan. Sometimes Manhattan distance is called Canberra distance as well, if you've ever seen that one. Okay. So we're going to convert our data frame into distances. Okay. And what that does is it takes this line for BMAY2 and figures out how related is it to cause, how related is it to get, get ed, get ing, have, etc. Uh, versus Manhattan. Euclidean is the hypotenuse, the straightest distance. Manhattan is the longest distance in a city block. I'm sorry, mm -mm, sorry. Maximum is the longest city block distance, um, meaning uh, straight like across X or across Y. Okay. Uh, Euclidean is the direct hypotenuse. I don't, I don't see people use Manhattan, I'm sorry, I don't see people use maximum that much, but there are times when it's useful. All right, we're going to mostly stick with Euclidean because it's most popular. The dist function is in base R. Okay. You put in the data frame here of of uh, continuous data. So this is the point at which if your data is already continuous, you just stick it in straight into distancing. So on the homework assignment, I have a set of continuous data for you to use, and you just plug it straight in here. Okay, so we don't have to make the behavioral profile first. 
because you have continuous data. Okay. Um, and then here's an example of what distancing looks like. Okay. Now, the distance numbers, remember that smaller is closer. So get to and be made to have a close distance, but cause to and be made to have a larger distance. You always need to look at your distance metric because a quick glance at it will usually tell you what's potentially going to go wrong in the next step. Um, and so if you have one metric that has a very large number and the rest of them are all small, take that bad boy out. Because um, sometimes things, when the scales are very different, will give you very large distancing. And so you have to decide if you want to sort of um, uh, rescale the data first. So if all of your variables are like 0 to 1, and you suddenly have a variable that's 0 to 200, it can sometimes cause problems in these models. So just a warning. These all look pretty good. They're all pretty um, similar numbers, meaning there's not zeros and ones and 5,000s. Okay? There's no... Distance doesn't have a, a, it's positive, but it doesn't have a bounds, right? All right. So from here to the end, you can do this on any continuous data. So this first part that we just did was really making the data continuous. Okay. And semantic, semantic vector space models, which are the next several weeks, um, really rely on these distancing ideas in a different mathematical form. Okay, I've already said that. Okay. Now let's cluster. Okay. So there are a lot of types of clustering. The big two common ones are k-means and hierarchical cluster analysis. We're going to do hierarchical cluster analysis um, because we assume there is some sort of hierarchy to the data, um, and they kind of work in different directions. I would say, like data science-wise, k-means is really popular, and I've tried both, and they tend to give you the same answer, depending. Um, and we'll talk about what the difference is in just a second. So this is going to create us a demo, dendogram, a little, little dendogram, which is very similar to the idea of a conditional inference tree. However, it works from the leaves up, so it assumes that every object is a different leaf or a different cluster and merges the ones that are most similar. Okay. Um, whereas k-means starts with a set number of clusters and breaks them down. Okay. So we're talking about the difference between agglomerative and divisive clustering. Okay. So growing from the roots to the leaves, where you have one big cluster and then splitting them, is called divisive clustering. That's more of what k-means does. It's like, OK, you want three clusters. Okay, well, here's how all of that clusters together. So I'm going to create these three clusters and then sort of tell you how that works within those. Um, growing from the leaves to the roots, where everything is a different thing, and then we slowly combine them together, it's called agglomerative clustering. Okay. Um, so we're going to focus on agglomerative clustering. I would tell you if you know how many clusters you want, try k-means. If you don't really have a good clue and you just kind of want to see, try higher. So we can do complete, single, average, and ward, and people pick ward because it tends to pre produce the most understandable clusters. By compact clusters, I mean it tends to cluster them well. And so we're going to use that cluster package. The function is hclus for hierarchical cluster. Notice here that this is distance. So you should fill in distance, not BP, the profiles. Method here is ward D2. Uh, the difference between ward and ward D2 and R is a um, very small mathematical one. If you want to get what people think of as ward, you do ward D2. Okay. So I saved that model so I can do some stuff with it. First thing I want to do is paint a pretty picture. And this to me is like where it's at. If you have I, some of the uh, data sets that I have that I really like doing clustering on have too many, <laughs> too many damn branches, right? So I have too many leaves. But um, if you have kind of a smaller data set like this, it's really nice. So hang here just kind of lines them all up. 
Um, and so the first thing that happened was it clustered together get to and have. Okay, and then it added be made to so that the space, the distancing here up and down um, shows you when the cluster was created. So all of these get clustered together before anything on this side gets starts to group together. So this to me looks like two clusters, but if you want to know the optimal number of, of groupings, you can test that. Okay. So quick interpretation. Um, I'm sorry, let's talk about optimal number of groupings first. <laughs> silhouette width is what that's called. Um, a silhouette is the average well-formedness. And it's sort of a measure of how much they cluster together and everything else is a different thing. Um, and so clusters that are not well formed are noisy and they kind of like this one over here could be over here, it could be over here. So I think about this like Mean Girls, right? So in those kinds of movies where everyone's like, you are a jock or you are a band geek or you are a, a mean girl. Right? and you don't ever go between the two, okay, that would be a well-formed set of clusters. Clusters that are noisy are when you're in multiple clusters. Okay. So a zero is bad, a one is perfectly clustered. Okay. Um, remember that for distancing, zero means close, one means bigger means farther. But here, zero means no relationship between clusters, really, they're just kind of a mess and one where they're perfectly clustered, like correlation. And so what I can do is, let's say I decide it's two clusters. Okay. Looking at this picture, two looks pretty nice. Right? So everybody over here, everybody over here. I made the decision, so what I can do is predict what group people should be in based on their cluster. Now this is very easy to see in the picture, but you can use this variable to then do some other analyses. Um, so I could say, give me two clusters. So K here is the number of clusters. The function is, um, I always think about this as cut tree, but it should have two T's for that. But this is where you're cutting your branches. And that just told me what group it should go in. If I want to see the silhouette length for two clusters, the function is silhouette. You put in um, the cut tree option where you're splitting. Okay, so the, the model, the number of clusters, and then the distances themselves. And this function sort of calculates how close everybody is in each cluster and how far apart everybody is from the other cluster. And what we want is the average width. Okay, so you can actually get the width or the silhouette for every item, but here we kind of want the average. So on average, how close are they to each other and how far are they from everything else? Okay. So remember, zero is the bottom, one is the top, this is somewhere in the middle. Okay. By itself, I don't know that silhouette length is super useful. Instead, what we could do is look at all of our possible options and pick the most well-formed. So you can run two, two sort of the minimum clusters, one doesn't really count, up to n minus one clusters, okay, n being the number of variables. And that uh, you don't want to run n clusters because that's the very bottom of the chart. So you can't run no clusters or one, and you don't really want to run n clusters because that implies that you either didn't cluster or clustered everything together. So we're picking the middle here. So two clusters, minimum number, two, everybody's different but these two people. Okay. And you kind of don't want the top either. You usually want a smaller number of clusters. Okay. So I'm going to run two to eight because I have nine variables. Okay. And I just run that silhouette function again. Okay. And now what it's given me back is a, a vector of all of those options. So here's two, here's three, four, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So you can tell that the options really here, it's two or three clusters. Okay. There's serious degradation of fit as we get into more clusters. So it's somewhere between two and three. Usually people ask me, what's the 
maximum difference for it to be important? I don't have an answer for you. Um, I would say if you if you think the interpretation is better with more clusters, go with that. If you think the interpretation is better with less clusters, go with that. What do you mean? So in looking at these silhouettes, I could say it's either two or three clusters, and these are pretty close silhouette lengths. So I would want to look at that picture and see if three clusters makes more sense theoretically than two. Oh, a degradation of function. Degradation of fit is more what I was saying. So once I get up here into four, five, six, seven, the clusters are noisier. And so these do not represent um, the algorithm of the data as well as two or three clusters. Okay. This is just too noisy. Great. So I can replot this, and this rectangle option will just draw essentially a square around your clusters. So if I do three, here's what happens. If you do two, it, it's pretty obvious. Um, but if I do three, what I get is the entire left side. Be made, get, have, get again, and have. So kind of interesting here that get two and have joined together, and then get ed and have ed joined together. Um, but this get going or get ing is kind of here by itself. And I don't know that I want a cluster one. That's not really a cluster at that point, right? So two clusters probably, even though the silhouette length is a little bit smaller, is probably a best representation of the data. You know, this is one set of verbs, causative verbs, and this is another set of causative verbs. These have similar profiles. They all act the same way. They're probably synonyms. These have different profiles. They all act the same way. This really allows us to see polysemy too because there's two gets and haves over here and a get and a have over here. So clearly they have different instances when they're used. So there's different um, profiles, you want to call this profiles, or there's different uh, internal category structures. From that you can create what's called a snake plot. And snake plots are used to visualize the sort of differences in clusters. Um, and so instead of creating distance scores between variables, we now create different scores between clusters and plot that. And so the way I'm going to create this picture is um, decide I'm going to go with two. So I'm going to cut my tree and save. This essentially is which cluster it goes into, one or two. I'm going to just subset the data. So if you like the subset function or filter, if you're a tidyverse person, do that. Either way, I'm going to save um, the rows that belong to cluster one and the rows that belong to cluster two. So if you have four clusters, you do this four times. Um, and then you just create some different scores, the difference between cluster one and cluster two. Okay. Let's say you have four or five clusters, you would have to do this for every pair of clusters. Okay, so these are based on pairs. Okay. So we're calculating the, the difference in cluster mean. Okay. And I'll show you this, the plot down here in a minute. It's called a snake plot because it creates this kind of ogive curve um, or a logic curve. And I feel like we did these last week. I might be confusing my two classes, but we've created pictures like this before, but now they just have a different interpretation. Um, so we're going to make a plot uh, and sort those differences. This times 1.2 is just to give it a little bit of room to put the names on the graph. We're going to sort that. Uh, the y-axis is 1 to the number of distances. This creates an empty plot. X and Y axis text are pretty obvious. Then throw the names on there. And so what a snake plot is, is it represents the variable or the combination of the variables here, but the variable that best 
um, represents the distances, the differences between clusters. So when we created this uh, cluster diagram, what we have is how they, the columns essentially clustered together. This is how the rows cluster together. Um, and so if it is a cluster two, it is most likely, everything here on the left, um, going to be an inanimate actor and actee. So these are the best predictors of cluster two, which should sound familiar because those were important when we talked about this as the um, trees last week. Okay. Um, if it's cluster one, more than likely going to be animate actors. Okay. So going back, let's get down here. Do, do, do. Cluster one right, is B made to B, get B, get B, have these. These are going to be inanimate actors. Cause, get going, or get ING, have ING, and make V are all going to be animate. Okay, so snake plot, it just allows me to see what the differences in are between clusters. So right here in the middle, this is no difference between clusters. So this co-reference and negative uh, and possessive just don't do nearly anything for us. Okay. And a little bit on these, um, the type of event, which we saw last time. So this really mimics a lot of the results that we saw in our um, conditional inference tree but now I have taken the, the predictiveness and clustered the groups together. Okay, with the conditional inference tree, I've just seen like which condition is the most likely combination for get versus make. But now I've clustered together special types of get and make because they have the same conditional path. Okay. Uh, that's why I said a lot of these analyses, uh, their answers will come together. They have a similar, they'll give you a similar picture of the data, but it kind of depends on what kind of question. Do you want to know how the verbs cluster together? Do this. Do you want to know the, the conditional combinations? Do a tree. Or do both. To provide some sort of fit statistics for the data, we're going to use bootstrapping. Big shock. Right? So, the function here is PV clust. Um, so we're going to kind of bootstrap our analysis. Notice the little T here. T means transpose. It flips the data um, because this particular function wants the data to be in a, the different, um, where the important part is the column and not the row. Uh, H clust wants the, if it clusters by rows. Okay, so I'm just going to flip it. Otherwise, it runs the same. Uh, notice this is on the original data because the distancing also happens within this function. As opposed to where we made the distances and then ran the H clust. So H clust requires the data be set up where the clustering factors are rows and they're already in distances. PV clust requires the clustering factor to be on columns and they're not in distances. Yeah, that's the big difference between the two. <clears throat> Um, so what we'll get out of this is a picture that tells us two things. The uh, approximately unbiased probability of the solution or the bootstrap probability. Okay. This is different than normal probability. We want values close to 100, meaning that this is going to replicate. Okay. So we're going to create that same picture. Okay. You should see the same literal, the same literal cluster picture. Um, it'll show you what, the nice thing here is it tells you what order things got clustered in. So one, two, three, four, little gray ones here are um, when each piece got combined. Uh, red is approximately unbiased. BP is bootstrap probability. And we will just want high scores. Okay. So here, um, this cluster is a little unstable. Okay, over here as well, um, and then potentially also here. So these are the prob This is the, the the likelihoods of these clusters continuing to form in the same way across all these different bootstraps. Is what's happening. Okay, so these two got joined together first, 59% of the time in the bootstraps, and if we unbias that statistic a little bit, it's more like 64%. Okay. 
I'm usually very suspicious of the ones that are very different. So this over here, this cluster over here, seems a little unstable to me um, because that number is pretty low. Uh, so that's really kind of what you look for is that them to both be high. Okay. So in summary, uh, so what does this tell me? Basically this idea, uh, most of these are pretty stable, so I expect this picture to replicate um, in, a, in a different data set. Uh, and the things that might not might be the ones that are uh, lower proportions. So in summary, we learned about models and theories, um, and very specifically that we kind of expect that this process, this clustering process, is kind of what the brain is doing. Okay. And we're probably clustering on features. So it's called behavioral profiles because we're taking a look at all of the features and seeing which, uh, in this case, verbs have the same features. Uh, this is kind of like a category analysis. Um, and the next week when we do vector space models, it's the same idea. We're looking at how likely words appear in the same context in different documents. So we kind of move away from this idea of features and move more into like more naturalistic text. Um, but this set of analyses implies kind of the network of what's happening in the brain, okay. or at least um, what features and friends each word has, right? So these animate and inanimate features tend to cluster together at predicting that get and have are very similar uh, and they're friends. So what we're, we're really, in this model, the nice thing to me is that we really have both halves of the, of the Collins models. So we have its features uh, and its related nodes. Okay. Uh, you, in, a, in a behavioral profile sense, we turned categorical data into continuous data. Um, if the data is already continuous, just kind of skip that step. And then we learned a little bit about distancing. So um, that's really important for the next couple weeks. Uh, and then hierarchical clustering and some other extensions that we will cover are principal components analysis, multidimensional scaling, and then there's one more. I've lost it. There's another one that we're gonna do. I don't know why it's not coming to me. Um, motion charts. Clusters, profiles, dang it. The whole half, second half of the semester is about creating pictures. Uh, correspondence, correspondence analysis is the last one. Okay. Uh, and then some uh, extensions uh, could also be other clustering methods like k-means. K-means would imply that you already knew how many clusters you were expecting but also very cool analysis. We're gonna do something very similar to k-means using correspondence analysis, so that's why I kind of left it out here, and we'll talk about it, uh, a similar analysis later.